Well, my friends, the time has come. Season two of the Space Circle television show has arrived. Um, whether we like it or not, it's here. Now, if I sound a bit rough, then there's a reason for that. I've had the flu for like four or five days now, but you know, if anything out there can cure me of my ailments, then surely it's gonna be Space Jonathan Circle and his band of, of merry Spartans. Right? Now, season two of the Halo TV show debuted at a ridiculous, absurd 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is really high. But then again, uh, so did season four of True Detective, and let's just say that that's not 92%. Now, we have both episodes one and two to watch today. Paramount gave us the old double whammy, so we're starting off hot with season two. Now, I've not seen any of these episodes yet, so I guess I'll uh, see you on the other side. Uh, I don't really know what to think, to be honest with you. It's kind of all over the place. There are some ups, and there are some definite downs, and there's some stuff that made me go like, huh? Uh, th this is gonna... I, I, I feel like I'm not gonna be able to wrap my head around this unless I just talk about it right now. Um, I will say, uh, for the most part, the overall feel of the show, which is a very subjective and ambiguous thing to talk about, did feel quite a lot better um combat scenes in particular mostly at least felt did like a lot more gritty people were saying before the show came out that they felt grittier and they actually do there are bits that really felt like some of the combat from reach or like landfall and stuff like that definitely a lot less kind of like gimmicky sci-fi like we had in season one but then on the flip side of that there's also bits where the vfx was uh, for the spartans in particular not very good at all i mean like really bad um quite confusingly bad. So the overall story, well, okay, let's talk about that first. There really wasn't much story in these first two episodes. The plot didn't really progress at all outside of the first scene of the first episode and the last two scenes of the second episode. Besides that, everything in the middle was kind of like from semi-pointless filler to absolutely useless filler that I never want to see again. Uh, but the overall plot at least of the episodes, is that the Covenant are going around various colonies and knocking out relay stations so they can quietly and invisibly sneak onto Reach, kind of like they do in the regular canon. And it does link very heavily with the regular canon of the Fall of Reach towards the end, but we'll touch on that later on when we get to episode two. The intro had, honestly, a really good theme. Season one's intro theme actually wasn't too bad but this one um we have a new composer this time bear mccreary who if you don't know has done like i'm trying to think walking dead is his main thing and then various other things as well um but he sampled halo 2's main menu music in the intro and it's fantastic it sounds genuinely so good i can't believe it sounds this good just quick fyi this video is going to be like whiplash because we're going to be going forward and back from positive to negative bang 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 very quickly and on that topic why does this show have an obsession with introducing like shamans and mystics to Halo? This, this stuff is dumb. Please don't do this again. Again, Chief is talking to some random shamans who predict his death or something. Like, can we not do any more shamans or magic or anything like that, please? That's needless to say, that's not a Halo thing, nor should it be. So can we just like leave that in season one, please? Seeing Chief use the grapple shot was really cool. Um, it looks really cool in live action. That's one of those things that Infinite added that I think is kind of unanimously loved. It just looks cool. It sounds cool. It is cool to use. And it looks really cool in the show as well. Um, the fight scene with the elites was yeah, hit and miss. There were bits that looked really good. By the way, I can't show footage because of copyright, which is great. Thanks, Paramount. Um, it kind of hit and miss. Uh, some bits look really good, other bits didn't look great at all, but the VFX in this fight scene looked a lot better than the, not fight scene, but like the action scene in episode two. The glassing beams and their effects look pretty good. Not quite as good as how they looked in like, for example, Halo Wars 2 or Reach, but I still think the effects of them look really good. They were very violent, very visceral, very imposing, which is of course what a glassing beam should be. Keys mentioned the colony of Fumarol, which don't know is where the reach the infamous reach trailer deliver hope is based where noble team with the previous noble six tom deliver the bomb to the covenant cruiser and it blows up but tom dies in the process that takes place on the colony of fumeral which was mentioned honestly with the way things are going i think we're gonna end up getting a noble team cameo at some point i don't think they're gonna be main characters or even like side characters but i think there's gonna be some kind of noble team cameo at some point there's 
too much being teed up for that not to happen. Something I absolutely need to sing the praises of is Joseph Morgan, the actor who plays Ackerson. He absolutely nails the kind of clandestine, very deeply shadowy only vibe that Ackerson gives off in the regular canon. And I'm not really surprised because Joseph Morgan said that he'd read a bunch of the graphic novels that Ackerson is in. So uh, what was it, Uprising and Fall of Reach, I think it was. Um, he's read the, the graphic novels and he's also a Halo fan as well. And you can tell that he gets Ackerson. This is honestly the most accurate portrayal of a game or like regular canon character, I guess, in the show so far. He nails it. His performance is excellent. Really good actor, really good performance. And honestly, the writing for Ackerson is pretty good as well. The writing for other characters in this is very spotty, to put it lightly. But for Ackerson, it feels really good. I feel like they've, at least so far in the two episodes so far, absolutely nailed his character, both the writing and also Joseph Morgan portraying him as well. Very, very well done. But then to do the old whiplash again, um, we're back to the rubble. And I'm sorry, I don't like any of this rubble stuff at all. They've made it out to be this weird like i can't even associate it with any other ip some weird like space hippie place where everyone's like some turbo eccentric weirdo and it's, it just comes off so forced and cringe especially this intro scene obviously i, I can't play footage because copyright but i i don't know i know it's meant to be in the future and i know it's a distant far off colony but i refuse to believe there's gonna be an entire colony of people this weird and eccentric it's it just feels very forced and very much like it's trying to be like, oh, very different. This is this is not like anything that exists nowadays. It's just strange. So if you want to actually play Halo and in true style, mind you, then look no further than my custom line of flood themed gaming PCs made in partnership with Apex Gaming PCs. From the pure form build to the grave mind and the super powerful primordial build, we've got a PC build of all levels to choose from. And even better, they've just dropped prices by a whopping 30% site wide. So just head on over to the link in the description and boost your PC gaming with some flood power today. Another bit that was strange as well was when Cobalt team, the other team of what I presumed were Spartan 2s, like they're meant to be, I'm pretty sure, were talking with uh, Silver Team. They didn't really talk like Spartan. That, that entire like banter between the two squads did not seem like Spartan 2 banter at all. It was way too antagonistic. It felt more like Spartan 4s. If they were Spartan 4s, perfectly in character. But they were Spartan 2s and it didn't feel in character at all. They were kind of like digging at each other. And not to say that doesn't happen, but the, I don't know, it just seemed quite antagonistic and very unlike a Spartan 2. Back to the rubble, I'm actually happy they're getting Soren off the rubble to go elsewhere. His plotline is kind of weird, but could be kind of interesting because Soren was the only good thing about the rubble in season one. Um, I mean, he wasn't even on it for the most part, but that entire rubble part of the story, he was the single good thing about it. So I'm happy they, they've got him off there to go and do his plotline elsewhere. Um, but as we found out in episode two, spoilers, in case you were wondering, um, don't worry, there's still gonna be a story arc on the rubble. More on that in a minute. So Soren's plot in this, basically he gets taken to where he's told is gonna be the location of Dr. Halsey, who has a massive bounty on her head and he's a space pirate, right? So he's gonna want that bounties. Spike Spiegel of Halo, I guess, in this sense, right? Um, but it turns out that the guy who came to the rubble to tell him that Halsey was here, was actually baiting him. Um, the guy, he has a, the actor has like a West Country accent, so, Basically, for Americans and anyone else who doesn't know what the West Country is, that's a Shire accent. That's a Hobbit accent. Um, so <laughs> it turns out that this character is actually working with, um, I can't remember if it was Oni or the UNSC or the UEG, but basically the guy's a fed, right? The guy's a fed. And it was so funny hearing him ambush Soren with all of these other agents to, to, uh, to arrest him for all of his space piracy <laughs> with that accent. I just, I just kept thinking, bro, he's a fed from the Shire. <laughs> Sorry, I was creasing watching that. Back to Reach, Chief takes a journey into the underworld of Reach City Reach, of course, the famous place of Reach City. Um, and it, again, very Blade, it felt very Blade Runner-esque, very, very, in fact, not even Blade Runner-esque, it felt like it was kind of trying to copy Blade Runner's take on like a partly dystopian futuristic city. Um, one thing I did like about that though is that this, this kind of like hologram of Chief that's animated very similar to how a lot of the billboards are animated in Blade Runner, both the original and 2049. Um, so like a lower frame rate, but kind of like propaganda-y. And it did look kind of cool seeing Chief in 
a kind of Blade Runner hologram, if that makes any sense. I, I can't show a video of it, so it, my, I'm probably not getting this across very well, but if you've watched the episode, go back and watch that scene and you'll see what I mean. Um, it was, I mean, the whole thing was very Blade Runner-esque. <laughs> In fact, speaking of Blade Runner-esque, um, we've got a new name for Master Chief. Um, no longer is he called Master Chief or Master Cheats or John Halo or Jonathan Circle. We're just going to rename him K because now he has his own joy. I'm not even joking. I laughed my ass off when this scene started. Chief going to the club. What will he order? Hi there, sailor. What are you looking for? Feeling lonely? Setting your visual parameters. Wait, hang on. Oh my god, they're straight up doing the K and Joy thing you from don't Blade Runner. <laughs> <Do that. laughs> they actually are. That's be so funny, bro. Yeah. <laughs> they actually did a K and Joy scene with Chief and a hologram pretending to be Cortana, bro. Oh my god. I, you know, in season one, if you give me a bingo sheet of things to, to put on that I thought would happen, and one of them was Chief doing what he did with a Covenant POW spy, I would have been, whilst Cortana watched, I would have been like, nah, 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 no way. And then if he'd done the same thing with season two, it would have been like, right, so will Chief get an AI girlfriend to imitate Marky and also Cortana at the same time? Kind of like K does in Blade Runner. I would have been like, nah, nah, that's ridiculous. Don't be silly, don't be silly. Well, the Mad Men have gone and done it. They've shattered my expectations once more, my friends. I can't believe this was actually a scene in the show. I can't believe it. So on to some more better stuff before we round out with an absolute stinger of an ending. Uh, this scene, we saw it in the trailers, but this scene of all of the Covenant ships rising out of the clouds looks so, so good. Honestly, it feels like this is where a lot of the early budget for the VFX went. Honestly, not too mad because it looks sick as hell. This shot is amazing. But don't worry, we're rounding this episode, episode out in true Halo TV show style. Um, so there's a bit of a monologue at the end of the episode, on the rubble of course, so you know it's going to end in a weird way, um, and oh boy does it. There's a monologue about finding monsters or something, I thought it was referring to the flood at first, but no, no, don't worry, it was just some um, incredibly forced metaphor, um, which is what a lot of these shows love doing nowadays, really aggressively forced metaphors, which don't end up coming off very well. But anyway, so there's a character given this monologue, right, and it ends up being... None other than Quan. <laughs> you believe me now, don't you? <laughs> so, episode two. Um, <laughs> the intro to this was kind of weird. It was like some weird, like, lucid dream that Halsey was having. It's explained later as not being a lucid dream. It's Halsey in some secret-only facility that Axon is keeping her in for some reason. I'm guessing to help in some way with the Spartan 3s or something. I'd, no idea why yet. Um, it's something to do with the, that artifact that looks like it's made out of polystyrene as well. Um, but the scene at the start was, I don't know, I know it wasn't meant to be funny, but I laughed out loud so much. So, Akerson is sending these Flash clones in to, to Horsey to play backgammon with her and give her, like, stuff as well and to talk to her and get information out of her. And every time when the when a flash clone dies um they get like a nosebleed and they die but the way that this just just watch it bro just watch it <laughs> i was not so funny <laughs> i'm sorry the way the way the way the flash clone's head just goes bonk on the table have me absolutely crying. Back to Reach, there's a scene where Silver Team are in like this almost operations room uh, and there's a, I don't know, Navy officer or something with this actual like physical board, so not hologram, not some like, like I don't know, alternate reality thing, like an actual physical, physical board of the locations and operations that all the current Spartan teams are on, which I actually really liked. I like that being physical. I know it's a really small thing, but that being physical over some like gimmicky conventional sci-fi hologram is a really nice touch because Halo's always been like kind of not grounded but semi-grounded in that sense it's not gone like full deep sci-fi like Mass Effect for example it's always had a few 
a few toes in reality, so to speak. And this feels like a little bit of that coming back home, which is really good. Also, on this board, there are a few Easter eggs. There's Omega Team, uh, so the ones from Halo Wars 2 and Halo Wars 1 and Arcadia. So, what were they? Leon, August, and Robert. They're on there. And also, there's Sigma Team. Yes, Sigma Team, believe it or not. Um, and two other few members of Sigma Team are actually Isaac and Vin from the Fall of Reach, who were in Red Team with, like, Fred, Kelly, etc, etc, and they were in the caves with Halsey at the end when they find that four in a crystal. Um, so they're in this timeline as well. I doubt any of them are going to show up, and if they do, it probably won't be in any great capacity, but they exist in this timeline, and at least a little reference to them was cool to spot. But then don't worry, we go back to the Quan stuff, and there's a whole long-ass scene where Quan is being tracked or something through the streets of the rubble and then she gets chased by a bunch of free runners who she very quickly and for the most part very easily disposes of almost as if she's got superpowers um in very stylized and odd ways i, I really hope they're not building up some like major secondary plot line of her on the rubble man because that's the last thing this show needs after season one. Trust me, that's the last thing it needs. The way this is handled is just strange. Like, there's one scene, again, I can't show it because of copyright, I'm sorry, but there's one scene where, like, she's getting chased by this guy. And she, like, I, I can't I can't properly show you this, but, like, so, okay, right, imagine, let me think what I can show you. So, imagine my phone is the, is the man, right? So, there's, like, a railing here, right? And the, the, the phone is the man. And she goes, she, like, the, the guy's, like, not stunned or anything. She's here. And she goes like, boom, and the guy goes flying over the railing. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't quite get where she got that sudden power from. Bear in mind, this guy was like a foot taller than her and definitely weighed a lot more. Um, who knows? There's a scene outside after this with the Spartan is with Silver Team training. And the whole thing is Riz is severely injured from the ending of season one where she got destroyed by, I think it was a brute. Um, and she has like extreme wounds from it still that are taking a long time to heal. And so she's putting herself through, or she's putting her, herself through. And also Chief is forcing her through like really rigorous training to make sure she, that she's combat ready. Um, and they're kind of pursuing her on this kind of combat training course. And the VFX here did not look good to me at all. Um, it just, I don't know, it, I can't describe why. I, I, hopefully the pictures that I'm showing on screen are doing it justice. Um, but when you see it in motion, sh certain shots here really looked iffy. They look very off. So one of the new characters in, in season two is Talia Perez, which is the one Marine that Chief sees right at the start of episode one. Uh, and she seems fun. Seems like an okay character so far. Not really much fleshing out with her yet. Um, but there's a bit where Chief goes to meet her because she lies to Akerson about the amount of elites that she saw when Chief saved her. So Chief goes to her and her family's house and has dinner with them to try and understand why she lied to Akerson. Um, and I don't know, there's a weird scene at the table where her brothers were like, oh, this guy's a Spartan. <laughs> they asked him, what's your KD? <laughs> they literally asked Master Chief, what is your KD? Which, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I hate that. I don't think it's awful, it's kind of funny. Um, to be honest, I feel like if Chief existed in our modern day, and if someone saw him, or like a load of people saw him in the streets, there'd be at least one person that would ask what his KD is. Surely at least one person. And then they say like, oh, don't you play Spartan Attack? Which I'm guessing is like the, hate, the silver timeline Halo Universe's version of Halo. I don't know, a bit gimmicky, but kind of, I, don't, I didn't hate it, it's kind of cool. So going back to the weird Oni facility where Axon is keeping Horsey, um, we get a new shot of the new version of Cortana that now doesn't have Jen Taylor's face. And Cortana looks weird. It's Jen Taylor's voice still. She's still the voice actress for her, but it doesn't look like Jen Taylor anymore. Um, Cortana looks very weird here. I'm not keen. I'm gonna not gonna lie. I think she looks. She didn't look great in season one. She looked very uncanny. She looks more AI like here, but. I don't know, the fact that she she just, I don't know, she just doesn't look like Cortana here. I thought this is Kalmia when they first showed her in the trailers, and obviously it's not because she's not green, but I don't know. So at the end of the episode, we find out that Cobalt Team, who Chief was angry about Axon sending on some unknown mission, were in fact sent not very far away. They were sent to a location on Reach. They were sent to the Visegrad Relay Station, so that should be ringing some major, major, major bells in all of your heads. And if it's not, then, well... Um, 
maybe go and play Reach again. <laughs> so if you don't know, Visigrad Relay Station is the location of the first level of Reach. It's where they first encountered the Covenant on Reach when they shut the Relay Station off. Um, and it turns out that the Covenant are in fact on Reach at Visigrad's Relay Station and Cobalt have been sent there to fix the Relay Station without any knowledge that the Covenant are there. So basically Cobalt have been sent to their deaths, but Chief wants to make sure they survive. So him and Silver Team kind of go AWOL again and they take a Condor and they fly over to Visegrad. And that's the last we see of them in this episode. So basically Silver Team are being treated a bit like Noble Team in this sense, like Noble Team in a regular canon. They're gonna be the ones that go to Visegrad and find the Covenant there and then relay back to say, it's the winter contingency, the Covenant are on reach. There's gonna be Chief or Vanak or someone that does that, right? Um, then the episode ends back on Sword Base, or back at Sword Base, which is a kind of interesting location. I mean, the episode was literally called Sword, so I figured it was going to play in somehow, but the Covenant are already in Sword Base. They're like underground in Sword Base, but there's a whole squad of Marines there that know they're there. So what I don't understand is how are the Covenant at Sword Base and the entirety of Reach has no idea? Because like the whole thing in Reach was they got to Visigrad first and shut it off. I guess that could be what's going on here. They've already shut Visigrad off so they could get to Sword Base quietly and covertly. But I don't know. I feel like if the Covenant were at Sword Base and Marines had been deployed to fight them, then the whole colony would know about it. You'd think, right? I don't know. I feel like that wouldn't go uncovered. But the last thing I hear is that I believe it was the Arbiter that kills them all. This character here, I think, is meant to be the Arbiter. Um... And guess who comes out of the shadows with him? Marquis. Um, so I guess when Kai shot her in the head or wherever she shot her, at the end of season one, she didn't actually die. She's here. She's alive. Um, or it's some weird vision that the Arbiter's having. Or a holo... I don't know at this point, man. None of this makes any... Or very little of this makes any sense, to be quite honest with you. Um, I guess I'll have to wait and see, but I'm just hoping this doesn't end up leading into yet another bloody chief and... Marky love story thing again because there's a whole thing in episode two in particular about Chief not forgetting Marky. He's not over her yet. He's not forgotten her. So I, God knows, man. I mean, they are going to run into each other at some point, surely. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was episode one and episode two of season two of the Halo TV show. I do think it was better than season one. Absolutely. Um, if I had to pick a standout element of it, I would pick Joseph Morgan's portrayal of Ackerson. I think that was honestly perfect. Um, that that would have a, a fitting place in the regular canon, let alone in some like silver timeline thing. So very, very good there. Um, the overall vibe was better, definitely better. Um, it's absolutely not 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> It's not got a higher rating than True Detective Season 1, I can tell you that for sure. But it's better. Most, kind of, mostly. But we're only two episodes in, and a lot of the episodes felt like filler. Um, so that's not the best sign for the future? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but, of course, next week we're going to have another episode, and the week after that, so... We'll see how it progresses. Uh, so, with that said, um, I'm going to round this out here so I can go and edit it and then get back to my next, like, proper video, which is going to be a cool what-if scenario video. Uh, it's a, actually a very interesting one, one that goes in a very weird direction. So, look out for that bad boy maybe early next week. I'll see, see how long it takes me. So, thank you all very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you all massively to all of my amazing patrons that continue to support me over there, as per usual. And thank you all once again for enduring with me through this... Uh, Halo TV show review slash breakdown slash me just shouting at the camera. So <laughs> thank you all once again, and I'll catch you all in the next one.